Good morning, class. Hi, I'm Keith Moore, and we welcome you to Faith School. Faith School is the place where my spirit is fed, where my faith grows stronger, and where I learn how to be an overcomer. Even though it may look daunting, it may look like a giant to you, nothing's impossible with God. You can come out on top. You, you can win if you'll dare to believe God can do it and that he will do it for you. Faith, like we've been talking last week, is a choice. So uh, come into the class and turn everything else off and, and give the Lord your full focus and attention for these next few minutes. And let's believe for that to happen. We just confessed to be built up. Lord, all of us reach out to you, uh, acknowledging that you are our God, we are your people, our life and breath and everything is from you and depends on you, and we thank you for giving us existence and consciousness and life. Thank you for choosing us, that we might be a part of your forever eternal family. We want to please you. We want to walk victoriously in this life and accomplish that which is, is good in your eyes, in your will. And so we ask for it. We ask for the utterance, the direction, the quickening of the Spirit, the supply of the Spirit that makes this happen. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Turn with me again to our main text in Hebrews 3. Let's continue in our study that we're calling Overcoming Unbelief. Hebrews 3, 7 says, As the Holy Spirit says today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, saw my works forty years. Wherefore I was grieved with that generation and said they do always err in their heart and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. That first uh, generation of Israelites that were delivered out of Egyptian bondage, and there was some two million of them, that through signs and wonders, God got them out of slavery, that their forefathers had been in bondage for over 400 years, over four centuries. So... This is, their fathers and their fathers' fathers had not known freedom. They were somebody's property. And they, in in reading in Exodus in the beginning of it, especially when God started dealing with them about getting them out of there, things got worse. They got a lot worse. They were abused. They were mistreated. And, um, but, Regardless of the opposition from the establishment from Egypt and Pharaoh that was one of the greatest empires and world powers there was at that time, God got them out anyway. Hallelujah. How many know God can get you out when nobody can get you out? Huh? Say it out loud. God can get me out when no one could get me out. Hallelujah. He can and he will. He could and he did. And you, you might think, and it would be reasonable to think, that after seeing ten major miraculous events that nobody had ever heard of before, things that nobody had ever seen, I mean, it was bright sunshine in one part of the the, the country and, and pitch dark in another part, uh, astounding things. Um, you would think that the people would begin to say, well, man, God's real and he can do anything, but they didn't. When they got to the Red Sea, they just went into full-blown panic. They blamed Moses. They blamed Aaron. They said, we got to go back to Egypt and it was only barely that they got them to stand still and, and let God do the miracle of, 
of splitting the Red Sea. And then they only, I mean, they rejoiced when they saw that their enemy had been defeated in, in, in the Red Sea. But in three days, just three days, when they got to Marah and couldn't find adequate water, and the water was bitter, they lost their joy. They started murmuring and complaining and, and blaming Moses and doubting, saying, we're all going to die out here. And this happened for 10 major events leading up to Kadesh Barnea in Numbers 14. And the Lord said at that point, he said, how long will it be before they trust me? And how long will it be before they stop despising me and disrespecting me? And the answer was, as you can see now reading the whole thing, it wouldn't have mattered how many opportunities they had. If you'd have given them, given them another thousand opportunities, they kept sliding right back into the same fear and distrust and hopelessness and talking death and failure. It's a choice. And it doesn't matter how many miracles you're around or that you see, you can still doubt. And you can still slide right back into it. Well, by the you know, same token, on the other hand, no matter what you haven't seen, you can choose to trust. Right? No matter how tough it's been, you can choose to believe. It is said out loud again, faith, faith. is a choice. He goes on to say, I was grieved with that generation. I said, they always err in their heart. They have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Now, he's warning us, saying, don't do what they did. Uh, go with me, if you would, to uh, Psalm 78, the 78th Psalm. There are numerous places in the Word where this whole thing that happened is summarized. Um, and you can see why it's important that we spend time on this. Much Scripture is given to it in the Old Testament, in the Psalms, in the writings of the prophets, and in the New Testament. In Psalm 78, let's start there about verse 6 or so. You'll see what I'm talking about. It's summarized. These, uh, these things are not just history. It, it's accurate history. But what happened in each of these events is an iconic example. That's what 1 Corinthians 10 talks about that we've studied previously. It said, uh, the things that happened to them, King James says, were in samples. We'd say examples for us. In the Bible, you have both examples to follow and examples don't follow. Examples to be warned. There is something better than learning from your own mistakes. Anybody know what it is? Learning from somebody else's mistake. <laughs> is that right? Seeing it clearly and going, huh. I ain't doing that. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. <laughs> Learning from others' mistakes. Like one fellow said, you know, the, the school of experience can be an effective teacher, but the tuition is too high. <laughs> 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 and it's not guaranteed that you learn from it either. <laughs> People say, well, your experience is the best teacher. Not necessarily. Uh -uh. You see many times where people experience things over and over again and still didn't learn. Didn't learn a thing. <laughs> in Psalm uh, 78, did you find it? Psalm 78, verse 6, it says, uh, well, read verse 5. He established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children. And see, that's what we're talking about right now, is that we're, we're wanting to learn what happened in the past for ourself, we are the children of the uh, following generations. And then we want our children after us to learn this. Why? So that they don't mess up like that. We're prevented. And the enemy is always trying to get things lost to the next generation. 
he's always trying to get people to, uh, you know, parents to quit going to church, quit reading the Bible, quit praying, so that they don't pass on what they got maybe from the previous generation and that whole uh, knowledge of God and His ways and right and wrong is lost to the following generation. And we're experiencing that right now in, in our country and in other countries in the world. We've got now, you know, second and third and even fourth generations who are completely godless. Uh, their parents and their parents' parents didn't believe in God. And so what you, what you get to is to people who have no standard of right and wrong, no concept. I mean, because if the Word is not your standard, what's your idea? Uh, it's just somebody's opinion. And, of course, that varies and changes, uh, you know, decade to decade or, or even, even quicker. He, he goes on to say, verse 6, that the generation to come might know them, even the children which should be born, who should arise and declare them to their children, that they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep His commandments. Hallelujah. God's will is just the opposite, that each following generation not rebuild and start from the same place their fathers started from, but that they build on what their fathers gave them. And they come up in the knowledge of God. They come up in faith. They come up in, in knowing the Spirit and walking in faith and walking in the Spirit. Can you see the contrast? The enemy is trying to get each generation to lose it in that generation and not pass it on to the next. He's a thief. He's always trying to steal. But with God, his plan is, and in fact, you know, my father in the faith, uh, Kenneth Hagin, who's in heaven now, he actually said this to us and to different ones. He said, for instance, when he was a, a teenager, he was diagnosed with more than one in, incurable terminal condition. He was paralyzed by the time he was 16 years old. And multiple doctors said he could not live. He couldn't live to 17. And it looked like he was going just that way. But by the mercy of God, he got a hold of faith. He learned about it in the, in the New Testament, in, in Mark and other places, without somebody helping. He tried to get preachers to come and tell him about it. And he tried to ask them questions. Could he be healed? But even his tongue was partially paralyzed. And they couldn't understand what he was trying to say. And, and in spite of all that, he was healed and lived to be, you know, uh, into his uh, 80s and had, what, 60 some years of ministry when they said he couldn't live past 16. And, um, but what he had told, you know, numerous ones of us, and, and he had Rhema and, and a bunch of students that have continued to come through there. He said, uh, I had to stand alone. He said, I had nobody to help me. He said, but you've had everything that God has given me and, and all these other industries. He said, if you don't take what we've given you and go on way out beyond, I'm going to come kick you. <laughs> <laughs> the reason I say that is, can you hear something of the heart of God in that? Does he want us not starting over from scratch every generation? He wants us to build on what we were given. Didn't the scripture say, others have labored and you've entered into the fruits of their labors? So that's what he's saying here, that we, are, we, we need to pass things on to the next generation Verse 7, that they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep His commandments that, and might not be as their fathers. And this is referring now to that, that first generation that didn't obey God that died out in the wilderness. They were a stubborn and rebellious generation. A generation that set not their heart aright and whose spirit was not steadfast 
uh, with God, stubborn and rebellious, that described them, which is another word used to describe them was unbelieving, unbelieving. So like we've said before, there is unbelief because of ignorance, but then there is this Hebrews 3.19, it talks about they couldn't enter in because of their unbelief. It's not that they didn't know, you couldn't persuade them. No matter what God did, no matter what he showed, he couldn't convince them that he was trustworthy, that he could and would do what he told them he would do about getting them into the promised land. At every juncture and opportunity when it was time to trust, they chose not to. They chose to doubt. They chose to talk death. They chose to disrespect and chose to reject unbelieving which is also rebellious and uh, stubborn. Rebellious and stubborn. Now, we we talked about this. Hold your place here in in Psalms. But let's look again at 1 Samuel 15, 23. Hold your place in Psalms. 1 Samuel 15, 23 is when Saul, who had become king, disobeyed God very specific commands. And then when the prophet Samuel called him on it, he denied it and argued with him. Everybody said out loud, stubborn, Stubborn. rebellious. Rebellious. And another word for that is unbelieving, unbelieving, unpersuadable, unteachable. And that's why Hebrews 3 calls it evil. An evil heart of unbelief. It's not just that they didn't know some things. It was they refused to listen. They refused to yield. And the scripture says in Ephesians that the spirit of disobedience works throughout the world. Like 2 Corinthians 4 talks about the, the God of this world has blinded the minds of them that believe not. That's why there is this Uh, resistance. There is this animosity. There is this independence. All, everywhere you look, this defiance. And what it's really about is defiance against God. And anything that represents Him, that's one of the reasons why so many people don't want to believe God created heaven and earth. They don't have science that proves that He didn't. They don't have any proof how things were created. They weren't there. These things are theories. They're not proven science. That people talk about, well, it's, it was the Big Bang, it was the evolution. These are unproven theories that are taught like fact. But the real problem is, is that defiant man doesn't want to be beholding to a creator God wants to imagine, I I pulled myself up by my own bootstraps. Through sheer determination and will, I walked out of the water and grew lungs. Then I lost my tail and jumped out of the tree and became a man and have created everything that you see before. No, you didn't. No, you didn't. It's a lie. It ain't true. (laughs) And people talk about, well, there's no evidence of God, just everything you see, the air you breathe, (laughs) your very existence. That's what Romans says, that even his eternal power and Godhead are revealed by the things that are created. The psalmist said that the heavens declare his glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The, the, the stars are his handiwork and they are saying something. Every time you look up and you see our star, the sun, or you look up in the night sky and you see all the, you know, the brilliance and, and the, the size of it, it just makes your head go, woo, it's, it's, it's so gigantic, so huge. Somebody made it. We don't know of anything that ever self-created. But if you acknowledge there's a creator, there's a God, 
What's the logical next step? Uh, maybe I should find out what he wants me to do. <laughs> right? A submission, and that's where the issue comes in. The devil rebelled against God. And he has led others in this rebellion. And he breathed this defiance and rebellion into Eve and Adam there in the garden. And they decided to disobey God. And that's the way it has been ever since. Generation after generation after generation. I mean little ones. They can't even really talk good yet. You, so they get stirred up and go, No! And the implication is, you can't make me. No. And friend, if you want to please God and you want to walk by faith, you have to resist this. You have to overcome this push to defy, to rebel, to be stubborn. It's evil. God hates it. I didn't say he hates stubborn people, but he hates the rebellion. And one of the reasons he hates it is because it's taking millions to hell. Taking millions to hell. Because if you don't want God and you rebel against him, there's only one other group to be with. And that's the leader of the rebellion, Satan himself. Everybody said out loud, I refuse, I refuse to, be to be defiant with my God. With my God. I, refuse I refuse to be stubborn, be stubborn. rebellious. And disobedient. I will yield myself, submit myself, humble myself under the mighty hand of God. Hallelujah. Man, the moment you do that, peace comes to you because that's your place. Your place is under Him and Him over you. That's where you fit, that's where everything works. Now notice what he said here in 1 Samuel 15, 23. A statement by the Spirit of God through the prophet. He said, for rebellion is like the sin. I'm reading the complete Jewish Bible. Rebellion is like the sin of sorcery. And that word's also translated divination. And he goes on to say, stubbornness is like the crime of idolatry. You know, there's a lot of people, they are, they're proud of how stubborn they are. They think that's a good quality. That's how far removed they are from reality and the things of God. Said out loud, this is a, this is a truth. The, these, are, these cornerstones are things you can build your life on. Said out loud, rebellion, rebellion. is like sorcery. Like sorcery. Stubbornness, Stubbornness is like idolatry. Now, there's a lot of revelation to be had here. Why would that be so? Why would that be so? See, there's a lot of church-going people that if you said, man, you're, you're being stubborn, people think, well, you know, you know all of us are, are stubborn once in a while. Well, would you, would you feel that same way to say, man, I noticed you had some idols in your house. You've been praying to idols? And they go, well, yeah, you know, everybody prays to idols once in a while. No, they don't. <laughs> no. Right? We, we haven't seen it as serious as it is. Well, I noticed you were, you, you were rebelling, you know. You are rebelling about that. Yeah, you know, I, I've done that sometimes. Uh, would you say the same thing as, well, I came by your house and I noticed you, you were going through all these rituals, uh, you know, witchcraft and divination. They said, yeah, you know, Wednesdays, I do that sometimes. <laughs> said out loud, not okay. not okay. Not okay. What do you mean? None of it's okay. Not a little bit of it. So is a little bit of divination and witchcraft and sorcery, is that okay for the child of God? Zero. None is what we should have. Then how much rebellion? How much, how much stubbornness? How much idolatry? How many idols okay to have? Huh? None. We, we got one God. Is that right? One God. Creator of heavens and the earth. We don't, we don't acknowledge any other God. 
And, and listen, you need to know this. Now, pe people do foolish things. They, they travel to other places in the world where they worship false gods and they have all these statues and all these rituals and they do it as part of a cultural experience. They partake in these ceremonies. Child of God, that's stupidity. That's putting yourself on the enemy's territory and it's also displeasing to God. I mean, God, have you read the scriptures? He is very intolerant about you participating in the worship of any other God. He hasn't changed in this. So no, no, don't do that. If you want to go see the sights, okay. But if they say, you know, you want to, you want to be a, a part of this blessing ceremony, who's blessing who? With what? <laughs> right? And, and, well, we're just going to burn some incense and, and we're just going to give an offering to the staff. No, 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 no. Y'all awake? Mm. Everybody should know better than this. Said out loud, rebellion, rebellion. Is, of enemy. is of the enemy. Stubbornness, Stubbornness. Is, of the enemy. is of the enemy. I refuse to be like this. I will yield. I will, yield. I will, submit, I will submit to the Lord my God. Lord my God. You know, the first step in this is receiving Jesus as your Lord. And if you haven't done that, you want to do that, just pray that prayer right now. Affirm it or, or reaffirm it. Say, I confess Jesus, I confess Jesus as, the life, as the Lord of my life. And I receive, Lord, I receive all you have done for me. Forgiveness, forgiveness, forgiveness cleansing, cleansing, washing. washing. I, have no Lord, I have no other Lord. I have no other God. No other God. Jesus, Jesus, the one raised from the dead. The King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, Jesus, you are my only Lord, my Savior. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Well, our time's up again. And as you can see, we're just, uh, you know, these minutes pass by quickly, don't they? We're just getting into different parts of this. But what you're seeing is not just the concept of unbelief, but the spirit of unbelief, the spirit of fear, just like living by faith is a whole way of life, living by fear is a whole way of life, but not our way. We'll see you again soon, back here in Faith School. I've got a victory living inside. Thank you for joining us at Faith School. Class is dismissed for today, but you can watch this and other episodes of Faith School free of charge at faithschool.org. For more information, visit our website or call us at 941-702-7390.